During the onset of spring 1945, the aviators of the U.S. Army Air Force in Europe were recovering from the largest engagement in American military annals, commonly known as the Battle of the Bulge. The toll they had paid, both in terms of personnel and equipment, had been staggering. Each day, fresh pilots and newly delivered aircraft arrived to replenish the dwindling ranks. P-47 Thunderbolt fighter squadrons were actively stationed at former German Luftwaffe air bases, situated just a few miles from the front lines. Their revised objective was to offer aerial assistance for the Army's onward push into Germany. Ranked among the swiftest and most potent fighter aircraft globally, the Thunderbolts achieved velocities of nearly 600 miles an hour during steep descents. Their pilots were some of the best. Seven out of the top ten American fighter aces in Europe flew Thunderbolts. Flying without pressure suits, only strong young men could withstand the forces of gravity built up after a steep dive. They were all tough, well-trained, and their morale was high. In March 1945, Arthur Davis was a replacement pilot assigned to the 362nd Fighter Group based in eastern France near the German border. They were all about the same age I was in my early 20s, 23, 24, something like that. And uh, there were very few, uh, a couple of guys that were almost 30, and we call them grandfather, that sort of thing. But there were fellows younger than I was. The morale was high. As a matter of fact, I was a little surprised because uh, they have always experienced several casualties over a period of time. And uh, I was a replacement for someone who had been, been killed in action. And uh, I was expecting something other than that, but the morale was very high. A fighter group consisted of three squadrons each containing 16 planes and 25 pilots. Sustaining a Thunderbolt fighter group consisting of 48 planes necessitated extensive resources, including lengthy supply routes, a contingent of 75 pilots, 1,200 ground crew members, meteorologists, operational officers, radio and radar operators, anti-aircraft gunners, fuel and distribution networks, as well as high-skilled engineers for runway construction and maintenance. Each plane in the group needed a crew of 25 men just to keep flying. And work went on around the clock. During its era, the P-47 Thunderbolt held the distinction of being the largest, weightiest, and most formidable single-engine fighter aircraft ever constructed. Its pilots regarded it as nearly as robust as a tank and remarkably challenging to bring down. With its 2,400 horsepower engine, it weighed almost 8 tons fully loaded. Every plane carried a film camera in the wing, timed to operate automatically with the gun trigger. Numerous frontline fighter aircraft were engaged in as many as three missions daily, necessitating meticulous coordination among every individual within the group to maintain these planes airborne. The confidence of the pilots and their ground crew was essential. Any overlooked detail could cost them their lives. 23-year-old Ken Bullock flew 46 combat missions in Thunderbolts during the last months of the war. You know, there were uh, supposed to be some rules about fraternizing with the enlisted men and all that stuff. That went out the window the minute we joined the squadron. We were all in there together. It didn't matter if you were a private or a colonel. You were all on the same team. You knew each other. I mean, you showed respect, don't get me wrong, but the, the people really worked together. You talk about cooperation and communication, it was there. And I am so proud to be a part of that. We liberated a, uh, a supply dump or something full of Mercedes convertibles. And uh, it turned out that almost every pilot in the 377th had his own convertible. As of March 1945, the role of the P-47s had shifted from providing bomber escort to delivering immediate air support for the progressing ground forces and armored units. Flying attacks from as low as 50 feet were costing many pilots' lives. A new man joining a Thunderbolt group at this time in the war had been a life expectancy of just two missions. 
with more than 100 combat missions behind them. Some squadron commanding officers had reached the rank of Major, many by the age of just 24. In the aerial clash above Germany, they would guide their comrades into the cockpits and down the runway. Nearly 50% of these filmed pilots, encompassing both seasoned veterans and recent replacements, would become casualties a mere 10 weeks later as the war drew to a close. The coming battle would take place over one of the greatest natural defense obstacles in Europe, the Rhine River. No foreign army had crossed the Rhine into Germany in 150 years. The battle would last for three weeks. All Thunderbolts were now flying three combat missions a day. 22-year-old Lieutenant Paul O'Dell was a veteran of 45 combat missions, many of them over the Rhine. And they would have a crew chief and the assistant there. They would get us up in the plane. Then uh, naturally we had to start the plane up in that area and have the crew chief get on a wing because we had a taxi out over chicken wire and straw and he had to guide us along because we couldn't weave back and forth to see where we were going. So then we would finally get to the end of the runway, and we'd get lined up, in the, you know, we'd get lined up in position or takeoff position, depending on where we were in the flight. Well, when you're on the flight line, ready to take off, I mean, some things go through your mind. Uh, I think my own particular deal, I, you felt kind of invincible, so you weren't really expecting anything to happen to you, and uh, so it didn't really prey on your mind that much. The day began at 3.30 in the morning, when pilots were woken for the daily briefing. At a dawn, the engines would start. And besides the throttle, you had the supercharger had to be opened up with it because they give you an extra horsepower to get the thing off the ground, especially if it was loaded, heavily loaded with bombs. Main thought was to keep the plane straight going down the runway and get in the air and go do your job and come back. You didn't think about being killed. Takeoff is a marvelous feeling because uh, you have full control of an over 2,000 horsepower engine. And when you put that throttle to the firewall, we call it, it's all the way forward. You've got all the power you need to take off and it, it thrusts you back in your seat hard against the tracks bed in the back. And you know that you're going to go up and fly. The conquest of the Reich was about to begin. In March 1945, just a short while after equipping their aircraft's wings with cameras, the Thunderbolt fighters of the United States would confront their most substantial offensive yet, a strike aimed at the Luftwaffe's air bases lining Germany's River Rhine. When you had 16 planes, usually there were three groups of four below, and the top flight was called cover flight. And they usually weren't carrying bombs, they were just there to protect us from uh, enemy aircraft that we may not spot. You are alone, even though you're a part of a flight of 16 airplanes, you're still alone. You're the master of your own destiny. It's an exhilarating feeling. Waiting in the skies was the Luftwaffe, desperate to stop the American Army of the Rhine, diving at high speeds from above the Thunderbolt formations. Violent dogfights would suddenly begin between planes barely 150 yards apart, firing over 100 bullets a second. I knew when I'd see tracers going from behind my plane in front of me that he was behind me somewhere and I was bound this wasn't going to happen and I thought oh buddy you have had it you picked the wrong guy today and I nail him and then go look for somebody else. For dogfighting it is exciting I could see these planes coming from my right and I'm calling to my my wing leader to break right so we both break right at the same time because you always turn into them and uh, they were shooting and uh, that was the first time I realized you could hear their guns inside your cockpit so that's how close they were. I just happened to look up in my mirror 
and I saw this ME109 on my tail, and I had 100 hits before I realized that I was even being hit, and I pulled up, almost went into a stall, and uh, that gives you an indication how fast it all happens. And you don't have much time to, to think about it. You're doing it really to save your life and, and get out of the gunfire. Meanwhile, concealed within a shroud of smoke, General George Patton was propelling his 3rd U.S. Army towards the Rhine, undertaking a bold endeavor to secure a foothold on the eastern bank of the river. The Rhine had been Germany's natural defense line since Roman times. Patton was about to attempt what Caesar had accomplished 2,000 years earlier, but no general since Napoleon. A separate U.S. Army, the 9th, had arrived at the Rhine three weeks earlier. Nevertheless, all its attempts to establish a lasting bridgehead across the river had been foiled by resolute Nazi resistance. Patton's plan relied on the fast Thunderbolts, knocking out German resistance ahead of his advancing army. Supporting the Rhine River attack, it got so we would be flying maybe four ship missions and going out, you know, many missions. Uh, we would take two, maybe even three missions a day where we'd be going out and getting whatever targets we could that would stop us from going across the Rhine. Now, we'd, be, we'd have, sometimes we'd have a lot of targets, such as a radio station. Uh, other times we would be going into front line support controllers and attacking targets for them. And that one town would not surrender, and they uh, announced to the people, uh, with loudspeakers, I guess, mounted on the tanks, that they are given five minutes to surrender the town, and that they never surrendered. And so we worked the town over. And uh, after that, we were finished. You can imagine maybe 50 or 60 airplanes uh, with 50 caliber rockets. That town was level. I don't think there was a, a mouse left. Without air cover and with no place to hide, the German tanks proved vulnerable to airstrikes. In a span of 110 days, over 500 of them were obliterated through aerial assaults by ground attacking fighter bombers. These aircraft surged forward at speeds surpassing 300 miles an hour and skimmed as close as 50 feet above the terrain. Even individual German soldiers found themselves abruptly subjected to thunderous onslaughts from these aircraft. Patton's gamble completely surprised the Germans as well as President Eisenhower. Silently and without discharging a single artillery round, Patton's Third Army clandestinely traversed the Rhine at Oppenheim, located to the south of Frankfurt. They successfully reached the eastern bank under the cloak of darkness, precisely at 10.30 p.m. on the evening of March 22nd. The nocturnal operation had cost only 28 American casualties. The following day, Patton's tanks, troops, and supplies streamed across the once invincible defense line. His fast-moving army spread out, encircling more than 200,000 German soldiers and taking them prisoner. Patton then ordered the captured soldiers to march through the city's main square as a symbol of defeat to the German civilians who were forced to watch. The German radar-controlled anti-aircraft flak was taking its toll on the American Air Force. Dozens of Thunderbolts were hit, wounding the pilots and damaging the planes. Landings became as difficult and dangerous as the missions themselves. So you would simply come down with your flight, uh, below the, the tower, and they would shoot a gun with a green light or red light, and you would peel off one after the other, and you would uh, literally go into a chandel, which is like going upside down, drop your wheels while you're upside down, and do a tight turn, and come in, and usually you, you try to do it under one minute. You know, there was a reason for that. If each pilot did it in one minute, you can determine that you have 50 planes, they would be landing in 50 minutes if that worked out correctly. Fire and ambulance crews on runway alert waited for the planes to return. Amidst a scarcity of fuel in most aircraft and others unable to deploy their landing gear due to flak-induced damage, a considerable number of pilots were compelled to execute crash landings. Unfortunately, these landings frequently led to catastrophic outcomes, including ruptured fuel lines and the presence of unexploded bombs and rockets still affixed to their compromised aircraft. The average life of a fighter pilot was I believe about four hours uh, as an average, but the, I think everyone was concerned with the tremendous losses in the, the pilots 
uh, we had an abnormal amount of fatalities. Just analyzing how many pilots we were losing, it wasn't that I was gave up hope. I suppose it made me try harder subconsciously, but I just couldn't visualize myself coming back in, in the United States and stepping off a boat or a plane. I just couldn't picture it in my mind. You felt badly when one of your uh, squadron mates got shot down, and particularly if you knew he was killed. I mean, you couldn't really dwell on it because that was it and it was gone. Yeah? I lost some friends, and we would we would uh, lose uh, three or four pounds a week, and uh, it seemed like it was always one at a time. At the time, the air battle over the Rhine was the largest operation of the Second World War. On one day alone, March the 24th, Allied pilots flew 12,000 combat missions, more than were flown on D-Day 10 months before. We sent eight out and one came back. That was a bad, bad morning. And when the guy pulled up and taxied up, he stood up in the cockpit and emptied his 45 into the cockpit. He never flew again. They took him to the hospital. The quiet period we had uh, before takeoff on a mission was uh, something that was designed by some flight surgeon somewhere, but it was a very important thing. It was approximately five minutes long and it enabled each and every one of us already strapped into our fighter plane uh, to uh, uh, re-sift and, and rehash our thinking and calm ourselves down to get ready for the task at hand. The first time I did it, I thought it was rather foolish. Let's get up and go. That was my attitude. Then after experiencing this quiet time once or twice, I realized how important it was. My whole attitude changed in that five minutes. And I imagined that it leaked over into the flight crews, the mechanics, the armorers, the other people. And they felt the same thing. It, it was sort of a feeling of peace almost that came across. The times that you really didn't feel like you wanted to go on a mission, I suppose, is when they would announce at the briefing that we're going to hit an airdrome today. And, and a lot of pilots would just back out. They'd say they they're suddenly would be sick or something. Not many, but uh, the pilots that went through an awful lot and you knew you were going to get hit. It's just not a, a, a guess. An assumption. It was an assumption. You were going to get hit, but how severe you don't know. April the 16th would be the darkest day in the German Luftwaffe's history when they were attacked by the Thunderbolts and their allied forces. The Thunderbolt squadrons of the 362nd Fighter Group targeted the Luftwaffe with devastating results. 24 German aerodromes were attacked with guns and rockets fired from altitudes of just 20 feet above the ground. Their air raids destroyed 270 planes on the ground and another 29 in the air, along with numerous hangars, flak gun emplacements, and fuel tanks. After more than three years of war, which had cost thousands of fighter pilots their lives, the P-47 pilots of the 362nd would show no mercy. On April the 16th, the combined British and U.S. Air Forces mounted one of the largest attacks on the Luftwaffe. 6,000 Allied airplanes targeted 40 aerodromes inside Germany. 2,000 fighter planes would take part in the attack. Their mission was to destroy the Luftwaffe once and for all. But German air bases were heavily defended by radar-controlled anti-aircraft flak guns. Many pilots and their planes would not return from this mission. Those that did carried with them the record taken by the mounted cameras. I have been conditioned to actually to hate the German army, the German military. And uh, this was brought about by some schooling in the service, I'm quite sure. Most of it was a subliminal type of thing, but I, I 
wanted to, to kill. It gave you a sense of gratitude when we uh, hit an airdrome in one sense, because it was payback time. These were the guys that were up there trying to shoot you down, and we had a chance now to put them to sleep. And so in that um, sense, it was a, a good feeling. I would peel off, first of all, and dive down toward the target, get the target in my gun sights, and then fire a preliminary quick burst to clear the guns and make sure that everything was working properly. Then when I got close enough, and I used to go as close as I thought I could, and they, they said uh, uh, they gave it a distance of several yards, but I tried to close a little closer because uh, I realized that although we had 1,800 rounds of ammunition, it went very quickly and I might need it for something else. So when I got as close as I dared, then I would uh, pull hard on the trigger and give it all it had for about two or three seconds. That's all it's needed. From a low-level attack, you would probably come alongside at about a thousand feet and then peel off down and, and come straight in on the target. And uh, at the time, you try and get everything leveled up and get the sight on the target and then give them the burst. That aircraft was one of the things we probably feared because there wasn't much control what we could do about it. And when they would set the guns on you with radar, you could hear it in the headset. It would go like that. You could hear it. And you knew that there was a, a dish down there that locked you in and they were getting ready to shoot. At the end of the day, 905 German aircraft and 40 aerodromes had been destroyed. Unopposed in the air, the Thunderbolts were unleashed over Germany. On April the 16th, 1945, the Thunderbolt Fighter Group and the combined Allied forces scored a major victory over Germany's Luftwaffe. With the front lines moving quickly eastward, driven by tanks and infantry, the Thunderbolt Fighter Groups were ordered to move with them. Captured aerodromes inside of Germany were to be repaired and used as forward bases of operation. When the Air Corps engineers arrived at Frankfurt to inspect an aerodrome, they were confronted with the damage that had been inflicted. What little was left undamaged by the Thunderbolt attacks had been destroyed by the Germans themselves, obeying Hitler's scorched earth policy throughout Germany. The Fuhrer had vowed that if allies did overrun the fatherland, they would inherit a wasteland. Luftwaffe planes were found destroyed by the dozens, crushed on the ground. Hangars, barracks, and supply quarters were still burning from recent air raids. The once powerful German Luftwaffe, which had struck terror into the hearts of the people all over Europe for six years, was now a smoldering hulk of its former invincibility. Starved of fuel and spare parts, its famous fighter aces captured or dead. In six years of war, more than 94,000 Luftwaffe planes had been lost, and with them, over 138,000 airmen. Runways and hangars were quickly repaired. The 362nd Fighter Group moved to their new forward airbase at Frankfurt, their fourth in ten months. From here, the Thunderbolts would rampage over Germany for the next 18 days, attacking anything that moved. The final humiliating misery of Germany was about to begin. There wasn't exactly a fear of not coming back. We realized it was the possibility it definitely was there. But your job was to get the target we were assigned and be sure that your wingman, or if you were the wingman, or the element leader or flight leader, took care of each other and to be sure you got back. That was our mission. Destroy the target and get back. Finding targets of opportunity was the order of the day. Skimming the terrain at low altitudes above urban areas and rural landscapes, Thunderbolt pilots would execute sudden dives onto unsuspecting targets. 
they would release a barrage from their eight 50 caliber machine guns, bombs, and rockets. For the German army, there remained no refuge, as there was no safe haven from this relentless assault. You could see the whites of their eyes, so to speak. Uh, uh, whether it was troops or people on motorcycles or, or trucks or freight uh, cars full of ammunition or whatever, you, you could very quickly see what you had to shoot at. So anytime we saw a train, first guy down got to shoot the engine, the locomotive. And you could tell if you got a good hit because all the steam would come up from it and the train would stop. Then you would pick at it car to car. Be, everyone would take turns until uh, you just about set the whole train on fire. Many of those targets were horse-drawn vehicles being tethered by women those wagons were full of ammunition and you start up your pattern and it was a repeat pattern you'd keep making pass after pass regroup start passing again and you'd end up with 20 30 horse drawn vehicles splatter all over the road and you'd watch the horses go flying 20 feet in the air when those 50 caliber bullets hit it was just awesome the power behind those bullets that and the roads would be actually red with blood. You did your job, but you didn't quite feel so great about it. Coming along, I happened to look down and there was a bridge that looked like, like a viaduct, an old Roman viaduct bridge in a way, and it had a, a truck on top of it. So I thought I'd, I'd just shoot the rocket at that. And then after I started down, I thought, well, I might as well salvo all four of them. So I let all four go and uh, pulled up because you don't see the rockets hit on the way down. And as I pulled up and turned around to see if I'd hit, well, the whole bridge was gone and the truck as well. I wouldn't start a dive bomb in no less than eight, maybe 10 or 12,000. Reason being, you come straight down with the aircraft. You release your bombs while you're in that vertical position. And then when they go, then the main thing you should do is get out. Get out of the way. The tanks were very tough. The Tiger tanks they had were really good. And they all carried, or most of them carried, a fuel tank behind them in a trailer. So what we would do is not worry about the tank, we'd hit the trailer and set it on fire. And if it came loose or whatever, then we would shoot the bullets right underneath the tank and they'd bounce up on, from the ground or whatever row they were on or whatever up into inside the tank because they weren't armor plated underneath, but they were on top and on the side. So we still found a way to get in. We used napalm several times and uh, it was very effective. Uh, one of the places where we could use napalm to full efficiency was dropping a load of napalm on top of a panzer tank. If the hatch was open, of course, uh, you can imagine what would happen. If the hatch was closed, the napalm would spread all over and immediately catch fire, and uh, it would be like having uh, meat in an oven. It would, it would, they would be roasted inside. It's like putting the airplane on like you would a jacket when you get in it. You wear the airplane and you become part of it. And you, you're pushing of the rudder and the throttle and the stick. It's all automatic, just like when you walk. You just one leg ahead of the other one. You don't say, I'm going to push this, I'm going to do that. You just do it. Yeah, we had many times where pilots were missing. That, that would be the time that you would dread the most when you'd get back into echelon for landing and there'd be a one plane or two planes missing. It just stayed with you for quite a while. I never thought I'd return back home alive as a pilot. It just never occurred to me that I would. In fact, I had premonition that I would never come back. I just, 
didn't think I'd make it. On May the 1st, 1945, the Thunderbolt pilots flew their last combat mission over Germany. Seven days later, the Germans surrendered. B.E. Day was uh, a big relief, you know, and then, then you knew uh, that you had a really good chance to get home. The problem was during combat, every night when you go to bed, the prayer I would say is, just let me make it through tomorrow so I can thank you for that day tonight because it was a one day at a time thing. And when we knew that it was over, it was a big relief. Of course, then we had another question right away. Will I be transferred to the Pacific? And some guys were, and some weren't. As jubilant celebrations echoed throughout the streets of Paris, London, and New York, the Thunderbolt pilots who remained in Germany assumed a solemn and contemplative demeanor. They marveled at their survival, yet were profoundly affected by the pervasive death, devastation, and suffering in the midst. Hundreds of thousands of German war orphans were living on the streets as beggars, while millions of liberated refugees and concentration camp prisoners from all over Europe awaited transportation back to their homeland. Throughout the continent, German soldiers were made to walk back their defeated country. German prisoners started to march through. There were hundreds and hundreds of German prisoners, and you could look the way their shoulders were sagging, their heads hunched over, they were a beaten army, and they just had no strength, their morale was down to zero. And uh, it was not a pretty sight to see. And there were so many, many amputees with either an arm missing or leg, heads bandaged. Throughout the war, a fighter pilot never saw the face of his enemy, only the face of the country. The end of the war finally brought them properly face to face, to see for the first time the people they had fought and the damage they had inflicted. In May, the columns of soldiers stretching for miles began their long march back to Germany from over every corner of Europe. Six million soldiers walked down many of the same roads and through many of the same towns they had conquered five years before but this time, not as the victors. It was a bitter end to the war. The death toll in the Second World War was higher than in any war of recorded history, an estimated 55 million. The European war that ended on May the 8th, 1945, had been a total war on land, at sea, and in the air, fought by the armies, navies, and air forces of over 20 countries, waged mercilessly on civilians. For all the battles fought during these terrible war years, more civilians died in the conflict than soldiers. The defeated Germany these soldiers returned to was in ruins. Not one family had emerged unscathed. But victory in the air had come at a terrible price. 18,000 U.S. fighter planes and bombers were shot down over Europe, taking the lives of 80,000 pilots and crew. During five years of air raids on Germany, Allied aircraft dropped almost 3 million tons of bombs, killing 600,000 German civilians. Five million houses were destroyed, leaving 20 million people homeless. The 50 largest German cities were reduced to hollow walls and rubble. Transportation and communication systems had ceased to function, as well as all levels of government. Hitler's total war had brought Germany to utter destruction and shame for the crimes of the Nazis. When you see the destruction at the end of the war, I mean, you can't believe how anyone could have done that and, and how anyone could have lived through it, you know, I mean, it, it's it's so complete destruction that it that it kind of boggles your mind to figure how you, how people could have survived that, you know. 
I miss the uh, camaraderie, and the action, the flying, the uh, the purposeness of missions, and and the uh, the sudden uh, ability to get something done. And uh, I don't find that as much in peacetime. Uh, we were all friends with everybody in the squadron. And we had a, a feel of almost of uh, brotherhood because we were involved in exactly the same business, each of us. And the only thing that separated one from the other was the length of time. How long were you able to stay alive? We trusted each other implicitly. There was never any even suggestion of someone who could not be trusted or someone in other words, I would put my life on the line for somebody else, and they would do the same for me. In the conquest of the Reich, the Thunderbolt pilots of the 362nd Fighter Group flew more than 3,000 combat missions. For their bravery, the group was awarded a Presidential Unit Citation but half of their pilots had been killed, captured, or wounded, and 48 Thunderbolts have been destroyed. The remaining planes were scrapped in the following months. He grew up in tiny Oil City, Pennsylvania, the son of immigrant parents. He showed no interest in flying until 1938 and his college days at Notre Dame. And nearly no one described him as a natural pilot. But he was a natural warrior. He was one of a handful of fighter pilots who launched themselves against the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. His first air combat was fought in a British Spitfire with a Polish fighter squadron. But he would make his mark with the P-47 Thunderbolt, emerging from World War II as the top ace in the European theater with 31 German kills. He would go to war again in Korea and achieve his ace's status a second time, this time in jet fighters. His experience led him to create a completely new set of air combat tactics that saved American lives. He was born Francis Gabrzewski, third of five children of his Polish immigrant parents. They lived in a small town north of Pittsburgh called Oil City and ran the local grocery store. They changed the name to Gabreski to make it easier to pronounce. But the boy who would become one of America's greatest air aces spoke his entire life with a pronounced Polish accent. Francis Gabreski graduated high school in 1938 just as Hitler's legions marched into Austria. He says his eyes were focused on college, on Notre Dame, and eventually medical school, like his older brother. After Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939, Gabreski knew the United States would be going to war. And when it did, he was determined his weapon would be an airplane. He joined the Army Air Corps as a cadet in 1940. He trained in PT-17 Stearman biplanes with sleek blue and yellow paint. Gabreski admits he was not a natural pilot. He was nervous, always trying to wrestle the airplane around in the sky, compensating for the torque of the radial engines. He nearly didn't make the grade, but he did qualify. And after some advanced training, was allowed to select his first assignment. He chose some place that sounded glamorous, exciting. I chose Hawaii. Hawaii, of course, I mean, it was a glamorous place. I read about it from travelage and so forth. It's a, a beautiful climate. The people are nice and tan, beautiful and so forth. And the girls are even prettier. But so, Gabreski found himself in at the start of the war he knew was coming. I was getting ready for church. And I could hear 
the bombardment off in the distance. And I paid no attention to it because the Navy does have a ranching amount. They, uh, they work seven days out of the week. They're Sunday, Sundays, when they probably drop a few of the uh, practice, practice bombs. And then all of a sudden I heard machine gun fire. And that machine gun fire was right next over me. And I looked out the window and sure enough, there was a zero flying with his machine guns wide open and so forth, strafing everything before him. And I saw the rising sun. And that was my first indoctrination into World War II. And of course, there's no question about being scared. I was scared stiff, but at the same time, I was trained to do a job. We looked at the line, and of course, the buildings, the, the, some of the hangar lines were going up in flames. The flight line was going up in flames. Our number one job was to move away the intact airplanes away from the burning airplanes. And of course, that wasn't easy because all our ammunition was in the hangar line. The hangar line was up in flames, and it was just like Roman candles in. In other words, you could see the uh, the tracers coming up and firing, and uh, they were more scary than they were destructive. So we did our work, airmen as well as officers, shoved out the airplanes away from the uh, burning airplanes. And uh, by, the, uh, by the end of, uh, say, an hour, an hour and a half, well, we were able to save about uh, 75 of the 150 airplanes that were parked on, on the line. We did uh, become airborne about uh, two hours after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was a very, uh, I would say, uh, somber flight. I uh, looked down from about 6,000 feet over Pearl Harbor and saw all those airplanes. It's, it's over off from their side, or going up in, in flames. And it was just a big, billowing black smoke all over Pearl Harbor. With much of the air power of the Pacific gone, and the Navy clearly in charge, Gabreski felt out of the action. The Air Corps found itself trying to salvage what was left of its Pacific bases. Gabreski filled his time reading up on the war in Europe. The Battle of Britain action report showed that the fighter squadrons with the highest kill ratios against the Germans were Spitfires, piloted by members of the Polish Air Force. Gabreski had an idea. He would use his language skills and attach himself to a Polish squadron to learn their combat tactics. He would then pass them along to the Americans when they arrived in Europe. His idea earned him a trip to Washington and a promotion to captain on his way to London. I came over as a casual, I came over as an individual flying with the Polish Air Force to gain experience. So I joined a 315 squadron that was flying Spit 9s, and it was a, just a super airplane. So I flew with them on 20 missions. In February 1943, Gabreski left the Polish squadron. The Americans were arriving in England in force, and it was time to put the lessons learned to the test. He joined the 56th Fighter Squadron of the U.S. 8th Air Force and met his new aircraft, the P-47 Thunderbolt. After the tight quarters and sleek lines of the Spitfire, the Thunderbolt was a battleship. After 20 missions with the, uh, with the uh, Polish Air Force, I joined the 56, which was the first airplane, first group that was coming in intact from the United States of America with a brand new airplane, a P-47. So you can imagine when I went from a Spitfire, which is nothing more than about a 7,500 7, pound airplane, to this great big belly uh, t a tub that I saw. I just, my God, what a big airplane. It was twice the size of a Spitfire. But uh, uh, 
it, uh, it, it turned me off immediately, but I, that was the only thing I had to fight with, fight in, and that I was going to learn to fly it. So I took the airplane up, and it was a good airplane. It was a good airplane because it had a turbine supercharger that could derive at 2,000 horsepower uh, at sea level as well as up to 30,000 feet when the velocity of the, of the uh, turbine supercharger would not accelerate any faster because it would de deteriorate, I mean, disintegrate. Unlike the mission of the Spitfire to intercept and shoot down attacking German bombers and fighters, the role of the Thunderbolt was clear. Protect the bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force. Also, unlike the Luftwaffe and the RAF, he was about to command a unit in a uniquely American Air Corps. We're all amateurs. The Germans were all pros. The RAF, they were pros. And all the Belgium, all the other Allied forces, they were pros by the time that we were there. So we were going to learn from them. And it took us uh, quite a few missions before we felt very comfortable in the operating field where we knew what we were doing. The U.S. 8th Air Force was in Europe to carry out daytime strategic bombing of the enemy. The B-17s were slow, long-range bombers, and the 56th Fighter Group was to escort those bombers to or from the target to protect them from German fighters the best way they could and come home. After a non-combat injury sidelined him for several months, Gabreski came back with a vengeance. On August 24th, 1943, he scored his first confirmed victory at FW-190. On September 2nd, he scored his second. You're not out there to uh, glamorize uh, the destruction of fighter aircraft. You're there on a specific mission to keep those bombers from being shot down. In other words, if you could scare away, which we have on many occasions, where the uh, Falk Group 190s and uh, 109s would break off because we'd start coming in head on to them and with our guns wide open and so forth, firing at them. So they'd turn over and get down to the deck. We wouldn't follow them. Naturally, I mean, uh, because we did our job. In January 1944, General Jimmy Doolittle, fresh to the 8th Air Force from his North African experience commanding the 15th, changed the general orders for U.S. Fighter Command. The only way to beat the Germans was to eliminate their aircraft and pilots. The role of the fighters was no longer to simply escort bombers, now they had clearance to pursue and flame every German aircraft they could, in the air or on the ground. February 1944, the 56 went on a binge. Gabreski called it the Big Week. Now flying missions over Germany using extender tanks, the P-47s of the 56 scored 59 kills in five missions. Gabreski owned three of them, running his number to 11. He was now an ace twice over. Now he was racking up kills faster than his crew could keep him in swastika decals. In May, he scored three more kills in a single day, with a fourth listed as probable. By D-Day, June 6, 1944, Gabreski was in contention for the highest-ranking ace in the 8th Air Force. 
Truth be told, he was anxious to match the numbers set by a pilot from his group who had been sent home after 27 air victories. A month later, Gabreski did the impossible. He beat the record with a 28th air victory. He could now go home. Gabreski had been overseas nearly two years and flown 165 missions. His fiancée was waiting with plans to get married as soon as he got home. Gabby was ecstatic. With the exception of an injury to a pinky finger, he had come through without a scratch. Gabreski collected his orders, packed and scheduled to begin the long journey home July 20th, 1944. He stopped by the operations hut on his way out to say goodbye. They were busy preparing to fly another escort mission over Germany. It looked like the kind of mission where a hot pilot could run up another couple of kills. He had 31. Could he score more? Gabreski decided he had one more mission to fly. They found an airfield west of Koblenz and decided to let each of the flights take a crack at it. Gabreski led his flight team down and during his pass exploded a German bomber. He turned to make another pass, hugging the ground too close. The propellers hit and Francis Gabreski, America's hottest air ace, was down in Germany. He would spend the rest of the war in a German POW camp. His Stalag Luft was freed on May 13, 1945. A year later, Lieutenant Colonel Gabby Gabreski, 26 years old and credited with 31 kills, retired from the Army Air Corps. But that's not the end of the story. Like many returning vets, Gabreski was anxious to complete his college degree and take up his married life. He and his wife thought the civilian life looked good, and he managed to snag a job with Douglas Aircraft. It lasted less than a year. Gabreski missed the cockpit and flying. He applied for a permanent commission, and in April 1947, returned to the Army Air Force as a lieutenant colonel. Less than a year later, he was assigned to command the 56th Fighter Group, his old combat unit, and with it came promotion to full colonel. It was peacetime work, but not for long. The tension in Korea finally exploded into open warfare, and Gabby found himself watching from the sidelines. The war went back and forth, and it looked like it would be over once MacArthur landed at Incheon. But in mid-1950, a new weapon launched into the skies, and the Americans found themselves fighting a hot new fighter, the MiG-15. Gabreski's command had just made the transition to F-86 Sabre fighters, and he wondered more than once how the planes would stack up. He was going to find out. In May 1951, Colonel Gabreski reported to K-14, the air base near Kimpo, South Korea. Gabreski was assigned to the 4th Fighter Group as Deputy Wing Commander. They had only 50 F-86s, and their mission was to distract the MiGs away from the slower Mustangs and F-80s. To do that, they flew the area the pilots called MiG Alley. When MiG-15 came into the theater, uh, that put another sort of dimension. That's when I went out to, to operate in the, Europe, in the Korean theater. Uh, because the MiG-15 was so superior to any other airplane that we ever had there. So the only offset to that was F-86. F-86, which, which was a... Uh, it, it was a, a Mach 0.9192 airplane, equivalent to the MiG-15. So that put us on par, and it kept, again, the, uh, the MiG-15 from destroying the uh, F-80s and the F-84. And did you get a bounce, cut him off, and drive him in range? When you get in range, shoot, and when you shoot, shoot the kill. Anybody got any questions? Okay, let's go again. On April 1st, 1952, Gabreski led his group back into MiG Alley.
He had four kills and wanted his fifth. He went head to head with a MiG-15 and after three passes, he watched the pilot pop his canopy and bail out. He was over his 100 mission limit, though he and another veteran had given orders that their sorties not be posted anymore. But he had had enough. With six and a half kills credited to him and his 31 from World War II, he is the third top air ace in American history. On June 4th, the Air Force sent him home. He had a stop along the way. President Harry Truman called him to the White House and thanked him personally. I've had everything from a squadron to a group to a wing and I've been in the cockpit up until I retired. Colonel Francis Gabreski ended his combat role that summer of 1952, but his career continued. He remained in the Air Force until 1967, commanding units at bases from Kadena to Hickam to Adana, Turkey. He had flown aircraft from the old P-40 to the heavy P-47, where he achieved glory. He made the transition to jet fighters in the F-86 and had flown everything up to the F-111 supersonic fighter bomber. His record of 37 and a half kills stands today. He set standards for performance and tactics for all his contributions to the U.S. Air Force. Colonel Francis S. Gabby Gabreski is a legend of air power.